Are you praying for Metro? This is where I normally give you things to pray for. And we all know that we have things to pray for. But this morning before we pray, I want to read the fourth verse of the song that George let us in a little bit ago, In Christ Alone. This is the verse we didn't sing. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. I'm going to get to it. Don't worry, we're getting to it. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost his grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, but with the precious blood of Christ. And we sang that. It's good, right? Listen to this. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns. Or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand. Let's pray. Mighty God, Lord, we come before you humbled by those words. Words that hopefully everyone in this room can proclaim as true. That there is no power on this earth or beyond it that can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, I ask that you give each of us that security. If that security is ours, I ask that you remind us of it. If that security is not ours, I ask that you cut our hearts, that you make us bleed as your son bled that you make us feel his pain, the weight of his sacrifice. And just so that just as he carried his cross for us, we might carry our own cross for him. By coming down this aisle, putting him on in the waters of baptism. Bless us, Father. Bless our church. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And the church said, amen. Real quick announcement before we begin, because we don't want to wait any longer for this. If you know that this is you, there is a silver Toyota in the parking lot. License plate BUA4904. Your lights are on. So either you don't care or you're trusting the Holy Spirit to not drain your battery. I want to tell you, um, I have a very obscure sense of humor. Uh, and one of the things I, li I like a lot is I, I like sketch comedy a lot. And let me tell you about one of my favorite sketches. It's actually a really short one. It's very quick, only a couple of minutes. Let me just pay the scene for you. There's a sub it's a subway platform, rather grimy looking one. And two people are standing on the subway platform waiting for the train to arrive. One is a woman standing in a nice business suit with a nice designer bag, but her right arm is in a cast and sling, broken. On the other side, a few feet from her, standing next to her, is a man dressed in a superhero costume. Bright primary colors, long flowing cape, and a great big red A on his chest. And he stands nonchalantly waiting for the train next to her, smoking a cigarette. There's a few moments of awkward silence as she glances over at this man in this superhero costume. And then she finally works up the nerve to ask the question that any of us, I think, would maybe ask in that scenario. Are you? Are, are, are you a superhero? And he goes, Yep. 
And she looks kind of confused. She said, R- really? What, what, what superhero are you? And he looks at her a little bit annoyed. And he says, my name is Captain Apathy. I have all the powers of Superman, yet none of the desire to use them. And she says, well, that really makes me mad. Got their arm in the sling. Just last week, I was standing on this very platform, and some guys came along and mugged me and took my purse and broke my arm. She kind of waves it at him, accusatorily. And he looks at her, and he puts the cigarette to his lips and says, Yeah, I saw that. fade to black. You would expect someone dressed as a superhero to behave like a superhero, right? Something special about a uniform, right? Right, ladies? I heard a fireman complain once about uh, not being able to get any dates, and I just, I couldn't, I, I, I wanted to throw up. I was like, shut up. What is it about a uniform? You know, it, it's, a uni- uniforms are special, right? They mean something. If you're wearing the uniform of a police officer, you are expected to behave honorably as a poli- police officer. If you're wearing the uniform of a fireman, settle down. But if you're wearing the uniform of a fireman, you're expected to perform honorably as a fireman. If you're wearing the uniform of a soldier, a doctor. Fill in the blank. You're expected to behave accordingly with that uniform, correct? Because as much as we might hate to admit it, what we wear says something about who we are. That's not popular That's not a popular opinion to express today. We like to think, well, they're just clothes, you know. And they are, but... Truth is, is that I don't wear suits because I like suits. I like how I look in suits. But I don't wear suits because I like suits. I wear suits because I want to look respectable. You know what it means to look respectable? This might sound shallow. It might sound petty. But church, we, what we mean when we say looking respectful, we want, we want someone to look at us and by how we look, assume immediately that we are to be respected. Listen to. That's important for a preacher. Even one that wears bow ties. Watch it, Dan. But it's important. It's important. I used to rail against, the, against this as a young man. My dad is a, my dad's an old school preacher, preacher, southern preacher. And we would argue back and forth as a, when I was a young man just getting started. And I would say, I just hate it that you know, people feel like they have to dress up to come to church. I mean, Peter was a fisherman. You think Peter owned a suit? And dad always looked at me and said, no, Peter didn't own a suit, son. He, didn't, he never wore a suit and tie a day in his life. But you can bet he put his best foot forward. And I used to not understand that, but he's right. Why is that? Because it's not that the clothes make the man. Clothes don't make the man. Amen? But they do speak about the man. And before any college age or teenagers get bent out of shape about this, if I'm wrong... Why do you wear t-shirts with sayings on them? I had a t-shirt like that. I still do. Um, I don't have this t-shirt anymore. I should get it made again or find it because I think it's out of print. But um, again, obscure sense of humor. I don't know if you, I I think I had it when I was here, but I might have lost it. You might not have seen it. It's been a long time. It said, it was a gray t-shirt and and in a, a yellow lettering it said, Haikus are easy. But sometimes they don't make sense. 
refrigerator. Now, if you were an English nerd, you thought that was very funny. <laughs> haiku. Ask Linda what a haiku is later. She'll tell you why that's funny. Okay. <laughs> why do we wear t-shirts with jokes on them? Why do we wear t-shirts with sayings on them? Why do we wear t-shirts that support a political cause? Why do we wear t-shirts that support, support a faith cause? Why do we do that? If clothes don't say something about who we are, why do we use our bodies to advertise? Right? Why do I wear a blue baseball cap with an old English D on it if I'm not trying to say something about who I am? You ever seen Paul show up with something with a, with a red hat and an A on it? He's telling you something about himself, that he has no taste. Now, <laughs> look, here's the thing. Watch it, Mike. <laughs> here's the thing. But we, we're trying to tell other people around us who I am, what I care about, what, what, what is important to me. I want you to imagine going into a grocery store and shopping, filling your cart up, and then you, put, you roll up to the register to pay, and then as you're standing there, you see a new customer come in, and he's pushing a cart just like everybody else, but he's wearing a full suit of plate armor. Complete with sword and shield, and he's clanking as he's walking. Ching, 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 walking back and forth. Putting bananas, pineapples in his, in his cart walking down the soda aisle and go, ooh, three for 12. And he picks, and he's shopping as normal, but he's wearing a full plate of armor. Now, you'd probably leave the store immediately. I'm popping a lot. I'm not exactly sure why, but we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. But he is, he's wearing a full plate of armor. What would, what, what would be attention grabbing about that? Why do people wear armor? Do people wear armor to shop? No. They wear armor. Now, see, we like to dumb it down because we're, we're a little, we, we don't, we don't want to be too aggressive. And we don't want to be, we don't want people around us to think that we're into violence. And we say things like, as I just heard, we say things like, no, you wear armor for protection. You don't wear armor for protection. You wear armor for protection in a specific situation. You wear armor for battle. You wear armor because you're about to start a fight. You wear armor because you're going to pick a fight and you expect to be in one. Church, this passage in Ephesians couldn't be more clear. Now, we jumped ahead a little bit. Technically, according to our schedule, we were supposed to read verse, uh, verses 1 through 9, but the comments he makes there about children and parents and bond servants and masters could be applied very directly to what we said last week about submission. So we're just going to move on. Read it on your own. There's a lot of good things there, but... Look what he says here, verse 10. Finally, being strong, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. No, that's not just a line from a possession movie. It's in the Bible. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Notice what he calls it. The what of God. The armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What does it mean to stand against? It means to draw lines of battle. For we do not wrestle. What's that word wrestle there mean? You know what wrestle is a synonym for? My mom and would, would, caught, would catch my brother and I doing what we called wrestling. But she always broke it up because she called it a what? A fight. There we go again, softening language we are, we, that makes us uncomfortable. He's talking about combat, y'all. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces, forces of evil in the heavenly places. See, that it's okay to talk about combat. It's okay to talk about fighting. It's okay to talk about violence in the spiritual realm because we are not fighting against human beings, church. 
We are not fighting against our fellow man. We are not trying to be violent towards our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our co-workers, our friends. We are not trying to be violent against them. We are trying to do violence to the one who lied to them. Look, if you hurt my brother, you and I are going to have a conversation. Do you know that? If you hurt my wife, you can say what you want to about me, but start insulting Stephanie and see what happens. Why? Because I love her. I love her more than I love her myself. If you do that to my brother, same thing's going to happen. Why? Because I love my brother more than I love, I love myself. Church, when we respond passionately to the lies that those we should love, and who's our neighbor? According to Jesus, who's our neighbor? Everyone. If we, res- we respond passionately to the lies that those we love outside of ourselves have been, told, have been told. Why? Because Satan looks to devour our neighbors. And if I'm going to get into a lion cage, because that's what Peter calls him, he's a roaring lion. If I'm about to get into a lion cage, you bet I'm wearing armor. You think I'm going to wear a turtleneck and a pair of cutoff shorts going into that, uh, that cage? No, I'm going to wear armor. I'm going to wear protection, and you bet I'm going to have a weapon in my hand. Because that's what we're doing. We're fighting. Then he talks about the items of this armor. Verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand with, to withstand the evil day, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. You know what it means to stand firm? It means to not run. It means to not break rank. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on, and I love this, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You know what it means to have the readiness of your feet? You're ready to what? You're ready to move. At a moment's notice, the only thing you're waiting on is an opportunity. That's it. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. Oh, here's a good one. Swords are cool. Watch Star Wars and tell me swords aren't cool. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert. You hear all the, all the warfare language he's using? Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that the words, the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. You know what the mystery of the gospel? I don't know, because the mystery is something you don't know, but you want to figure out. Here's the mystery of the gospel. I don't know why God would save me. Of all the people he could have saved, he saved me. It's a mystery, but it's the mystery with the best ending. You know what the answer to that question is? Why would God save me? You know what the answer to the mystery, you know what it says on the last page? It's not the butler did it. It says this. Jesus says, I saved you because I love you more than I love myself. Amen? That's why they call it good news. For which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul writes this from prison. That I may declare it boldly, as I ought to speak. Church, if you're going to wear the uniform, you better act like what you wear. What does it mean to be a fireman? What does it mean to be a policeman? What does it mean to be a soldier, a doctor? What does it mean? We have some men and women in this room who have served in the military or have have family members that are currently serving in the military. Ask someone you know that has served this country so dutifully, what does it mean to wear that uniform? I've known some Marines in my life. 
And what's amazing is, is that some of them were pretty, were, were pretty sloppy people in their personal life. I've been into their rooms, and I've been into their, their, their houses, and I've been into their, to, to their, their basements. They've had me over. Not sloppy in the sense of dirty or filthy, just cluttered, you know, like I tend to be. And they wear, you know, T-shirts, you know. Marines are guys like all guys are. They wear T-shirts that maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're having that, that internal debate. is like, can I wear it one more time and then wash it? Kind of a thing. But what's amazing is, is when I see them in uniform, they are buttoned down, dressed up, tight, perfect posture, perfect shoes without a scuff on them, every button in place, no, not a thread out of place. Why? Because that uniform, that's a t-shirt and jeans, but this uniform means something. Amen? Your armor means something. It should communicate to the world something about you. I'm going to tell you a story. This is not one I made up. This is a true story that I heard this last week. And I know it's true because the man who told me said it was true, and I trust him. A young man named Andrew is a registered nurse. One day, Andrew gets off of a fairly long shift and goes to Walgreens to get a snack on his way home because his blood sugar is a little low <laughs> after working so hard. Nurses work hard, amen? It's a hard job. My niece, Rianne, is a, she's a nurse practitioner, and she's been doing her, she's almost a nurse practitioner. She's been doing her residency leading up to that. Man, it's a hard job. I don't think I could do it. I'm not tough enough. This young man, Andrew, was coming out of Walgreens, and as he was coming out of Walgreens, having, having purchased his snack, a little old white couple, about 80 years old, man and woman, coming up the steps from the parking lot. I say they're white to tell you that Andrew is not. He's black. And as the woman about, is about to, to take the, the top step, she trips and she falls painfully to the concrete. And as people begin to circle around her, they soon discover that she didn't trip because her, foot hit the pay, because her foot hit the top of the step. You ever done that? That's not why. She didn't trip at all. In fact, she collapsed. And she's not breathing. Another thing I forgot to tell you about Andrew. Guess what Andrew's still wearing? His scrubs. Andrew drops his bag. He drops his Walgreens bag and he rushes over to check on her condition. And as soon as he touches her, the husband comes up to him, pushes him away, and he says, you get your expletive, expletive, expletive black hands off my wife. And he looks up at him and says, sir, I'm a nurse. She's not breathing. Now they're starting to notice that her color is changing. Please, just let me help. And he reaches in to go in again. He slaps him away again and says, get your black hands off my wife. Andrew backs up and says, please, someone, come on, call 911. Someone needs to call 911. This woman needs help. The man walks off to call 911. The crowd around Andrew begins to say, you're a nurse? You're a nurse? He says, yes, I'm a nurse. He said, you have to do something. You have to do something. And Andrew just finally says, you're right, I do. So he gets down and he start, begins to start performing CPR. They hear a shout from a few yards away. It's the old man again. And he runs in. And he goes to get Andrew off. But this time the crowd stops him. He says, you get your black hands off my wife! And Andrew looks up and he says, Sir, if I don't do this, she is going to die. The paramedics arrive. They come up. They're white. So the old man lets them come up. They take over for Andrew and they say to, as they put her on the stretcher, they say to the man, Surely if Andrew had not done what he did, she would have died. 
And as the old man goes to join his wife in the back of that ambulance, he says, he, as he, just before he steps into the back, he turns and looks at Andrew, points his finger at him, and curses him again. And of course, this did massive, massive harm to the emotional well-being of this young man who was doing nothing except trying to save a life. And as many of us do in times of distress, sometimes when we shouldn't, but in this case, very appropriately, Andrew, to share his feelings, went to Facebook and told the story in a post. And then he ended the story with this comment. He said, As I think back over what happened, I know this. That I had a greater responsibility to save that woman's life than I did to combat that old man's ignorance. You know why? Church, do you know why? Because as far as Andrew was concerned, he was a nurse first and a black man second. Do you know why you don't unsheathe your sword when God gives you opportunities to? Do you know why you let your armor rust and ding and fade? You know why? Because you tell yourself lies. You say, if I say something, they won't like me anymore. They'll get offended with me. Or I'm just not the kind of person that likes to argue. I don't like to take the spotlight. I'm more of a wallflower. Church, every single one of you who is a Christian in this room, when you were baptized, you were given a suit of armor. And if you're not going to use it, you have no business wearing it. Just like if you're a Marine that's not going to act like a Marine, you shouldn't wear the uniform. If you're a fireman who refuses to fight fires, you shouldn't wear the uniform. If you're a nurse who refuses to save lives, you shouldn't wear the scrubs. Church, if you are a Christian that wears the armor but refuses to fight for the eternal salvation of those around you who are dying in sin, you have no reason, no right to wear the armor. In fact, by wearing the armor, you shame those who do have that right. Amen? What are you doing? If your salvation was just about you, why did he leave you here? Why did he give you the suit? Why did he hand you the sword? Why did he hand you the shield? He gave it to you, not so it would look good on a wall or draw attention when you go to the grocery store wearing it. He gave it to you so that you could do one thing and one thing only, fight off Satan in the lives of others. Is your armor rusty? Has it faded from disuse? Is your sword dull and pitted? Frozen in its scabbard because you haven't drawn it in so long. Church, we should be ashamed of ourselves if that's us. Amen. But there's good news. And the great thing about armor is if it's faded, guess what y'all you have to do? Polish it. If your sword is dull, guess what you have to do? You have to sharpen it. And if you don't know how to use your armor and your sword and your shield, guess what the best way to learn is? Do it anyway. Because look what Paul says. And I'll leave you with this. Look what Paul says so powerfully. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, Stand firm, therefore. What's your armor look like? If you need to sharpen your sword, we're here. If you need to polish your armor, we're here. If you need to learn to use both, we're here to give you the opportunity to do just that. Or maybe you don't have armor. Maybe you're surrounded by people that do, but you don't have it. And you need Satan fought off in your life. We're here to fight him off for you. Amen? Christ died for you so that you could die for him. And yes, you get forgiveness. And yes, you get grace. And yes, you get the Holy Spirit. And yes, you get a family and a community to be a part of. All those great things that make us all feel good about being personally a Christian. You get all those things, but you also get a sword. And guess what comes with the sword? An obligation to use it. Amen? So if that's you this morning, will you come? Will we stand?